Thank you. So, good morning, friends. We start this IOA 22 Orthopedic Rheumatology Master Class Webinar, fifth in the series. The topic is Surgical Management of Fragility Fractures. May I take the opportunity to invite our very own president, Professor Ramesh Kumar Sen, for his inaugural address. Professor Sen. Good morning, friends. Definitely, I can certainly say that with this group, we have got maximum contributions, maximum enlightenment on a topic which is maximally important also. And considering the ways we had started, I think both Dr. Jha and Dr. Bhushan needs to be congratulated because regularly and very appropriately, everything has been stepped up gradually and reaching to the core. I mean, today when we are talking about the surgical management, which is most often we are likely to be involved with everybody. Where in the medical line, we may say sometimes that, no, no, this may not be my area. But right now, we cannot say and with the problem of osteoporosis, with the bone and joint. Now, I think today's topic is likely to be the most important, especially we have to manage the surgically also. So, this is the most important. I really, it has been a wonderful subgroup which has contributed maximum. And today also, I hope this will be able to give us a big insight into the area of surgical management of uh, osteoporosis and all those things related to it. Thank you and all best wishes for the show today. Thank you, Professor Said. You have rightly said, I also felt that it is very appropriate on the culmination of Bone and Joint Day. Now, we will have welcome address from President-elect Dr. Atul Srivastav. And in fact, this topic is his own baby, which he has been nurturing. Dr. Atul, good please. Morning, good morning, all. I did to each and every word said by our president, sir, Dr. Ramesh Sen, sir. And I can't be more thankful and grateful to all of you, the elite panelists, for contributing to this unique venture. I'm especially thankful to Dr. S.S. Jha, sir, for coordinating it so well. Wish you all the best and we need to take it forward. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Atul, for piloting it. And uh, I think Dr. Ram Chadha has not appeared. He's today. joined. He's with he us. has joined. Dr. Ram Chadha. Good morning, sir. Ah, good morning. So uh, I was thinking you must be there. Right. Please go ahead with your welcome address. Respected seniors and dear friends, um, over the years, orthopedic surgeons have been treating wrist fractures, hip fractures, and spine fractures knowingly, unknowingly, whether we are dealing with osteoporosis or not. It's now with the efforts put in by Dr. Jha, uh, Dr. Bhushan, and the entire elite group here today under the stewardship of uh, Dr. Ramesh Sen and Dr. Atul Srivastava that we have put some method in the madness. What I believe is that we should today look at every fracture as an osteoporotic fracture or a fragility fracture unless proven otherwise if the patient belongs to an age group where they probably would have osteoporosis. Having said that, our thinking has changed and today we'll actually see the culmination of the efforts put in by this very, very brilliant group as to how exactly we should address these common fractures, which we have been treating over the years, as I said, knowingly, unknowingly, and unknowingly, knowingly. So today we we'll know what we should do and when we should do it. Thank you all for being here and sharing your experience. Back to you, sir. Thank you very much. You have very rightly given a redefinition that unless proved otherwise, that will prove to be a milestone in the definition of fragility fractures. Now, may I request our Secretary General IOA, Dr. Naveen Thakkar, has, has he been able to be there? If you are not there, uh, whenever he comes, he will... Dr. Thakkar, are you there? No. So now I will request uh, 
President Ayura Dr. Santanu Lahkar for his welcome address. So good morning to all. So respected all the members present over here. So as already it has been elaborately given the importance why we should discuss about it. I hope that today this discussion will be a very fruitful one. And I hope without waiting, we can proceed for the meeting. I welcome all of you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for being so brief. Now I uh, request the convener to appear, convener from Indian Orthopedic Association for this rheumatology uh, subcommittee, Dr. Pannak Bhusan. Hello, everybody. Am I audible? Yes, yeah. you are. Uh, first of all, I thank Dr. Ramesh Sain. When I was talking to him, he said that since we are orthopedic surgeons basically, and today we are talking of orthopedics and orthopedics only. Second thing, I'll thank Dr. Lahkar, who is here, and request him to be the part of our IOA by MOU. Third, since we are here, we are dealing with fragility fracture. In 2022, there had been a webinar in America where out of all the fractures for osteoporosis to be treated, the most important thing they have culminated that it is the recent fracture. And today we'll be dealing how to deal with the fracture when the osteoporosis is knocking at the door how to deal with the fracture when the osteoporosis is bystanding and how to manage the cases when they are complicated by osteoporosis and we have to do the surgical things. We have a whole lot of informative people here and I welcome all of you to just listen to them and I'm sure that this fragility fracture conference or conclave of ours will go down the history of the management and everybody, every single orthopedic surgeon who is being knocked by osteoporosis on his clinic will be benefited. It is our grand effort under the steering leadership of Dr. Isasja, who had been my teacher from my student days. Therefore, please, please listen to it to its end. Thank you. Thank you, Pannak. Well, friends, we are constrained in time, but still, I am tempted to show that fragility fractures are because of compromised bone strength and it predisposes the bone to fragility fracture. All of us are aware that bone strength is determined by bone mass and bone quality. So what are fragility fractures? They are spontaneous or following minimal trauma and they are defined as falling from standing height or less. The areas that it involves is known to everybody apart from low bone mass, advancing age, previous fragility fractures, glucocorticoid induced uh, instances and the propensity to fall lead us for contribution to contributory factors. Now low BMD, age, and previous fragility fracture, especially the previous fragility fracture provides five-fold increased risk for a sustaining a future fracture. Now the challenges in surgical management of fract fragility fractures, we are going to discuss today. So there could be factors in the bone and that we would like to know fractures around the joint in the diaphyseal fractures factors in the implants and friends, we still don't have to forget that osteoporosis is a medical disease. So adjuvant post-operative use of anabolic medications or anti-resorptive medications, both biologic and non-biologic will be so very essential. May I now request Professor Chinmay Das, who heads his institution, is also the Secretary General of IORA, and many other organizations to present his paper on biomechanics of fragility fracture fixation. Professor Das. 
Yes, sir. I will you stop so share. Please, please allow me to share my screen. I will stop share. Right. Yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. And I welcome our IOA president, the president elect, the vice president, the secretary, IOA, as well as our uh, Professor Jhasar, Manishji, uh, uh, Putwalji, and everyone, DP Pushanji, uh, Amarnathji. So let's go for this topic biomechanics of osteoporotic fracture fixation. As Sir has already said, that it's a nightmare for postmenopausal and old age group to have a fracture with already existing osteoporotic uh, disease in the, I would say disease in the body. The leading cause of disability and morbidity in the elderly and the disease, it's also called the disease of aging or silent disease. And in the clinical setting, it is defined as the reduction of the bone mass more than 2.5 standard deviation. We have already discussed in our last webinar. As we can see that vertebral fractures, as sir has already said, Jasar, so around 46% we get vertebral fractures, osteoporotic vertebral fractures. Around 19% we get in the hip as well as total other fractures and risk around 15%. Biomechanically, the bone is weakest in tension and strongest in compression. Pure bending gives rise to your transverse fractures. We all know this, but I'm just recapitulating these things to help our postgraduates. Pure bending gives a transverse fracture. Torsional injury gives a spiral fracture. Shear injury gives a oblique fracture and butterfly due to bend and here we get a butterfly fragment. And always remember that smaller cross-section of the bone fails first. Why osteoporotic bones, they are challenging to treat? Because of the decreased density, decreased density and increased brittleness of the bone, the porous, cancellous and thin cortical bone because the cortical bone also becomes thinner in case of osteoporosis, then fracture into multiple and smaller fragments, which we get in osteoporotic fractures. The fractures, they are more complex than the healthy bone fractures. Limitation in weight bearing after fracture fixation is there. Overloading of the fracture fixation. Construct is there, as well as there are comorbid conditions in these uh, elderly people. And uh, it's not the only conditions the elderly has to face because they have got other comorbid conditions too. Thus, what fixation requires, the fixation we require for these operative procedures, they should be enduring stable fracture fixation and unrestricted road bearing capacity should be there in these implants or whatever you are using. Otherwise, what you get, you get cut out of the screws, plates, then lose of the loss of the screw fixation and spontaneous fractures you get. Because uh, in these cases, the bone to bone contact is very important. You get various collapse because of the medial buttressing effect, lack of medial buttressing effect. So you get uh, you may get post-operative also various collapse if your implant is not sufficient to hold the fracture. Just some technical tips. Less cortical and cancellous bone of the screw threads to gain purchase, which is pull out strength is reduced if you uh, if the, the, the in osteoporotic fractures, what happens? The cancellous as well as the cortical bone is reduced in size in uh, in the material so you get less purchase low transmission at the bone implant interface exceeds the reduced strain tolerance of the osteoporotic bone the decreased risk to decrease these risk of failure of these bone implant interface 
it's advocated to use a relative stability techniques like your intramedullary nails, bone impaction is a must, buttress fixation, then fixed devices, fixed angle devices, lock plates, bone augmentation, or joint replacement. And absolute stability techniques and lag screws are usually inappropriate. There is an algorithm uh, given by Snyder and Gianodis that in osteoporotic fracture, what you see is whether there is any comorbidities or not. You have to find out, as Sir has rightly pointed out, that uh, whether it's a metaphyseal, diaphyseal, or intraarticular, or a spinal fracture, because spinal fractures are most of the time they are missed. Degree of fragmentation should be found out. Then treatment options, what we have is non-operative, which may be as uh, external splintage and operative. We can go for fixation of the fractures as well as joint replacements. In fixation, we have to always take care that it is augmented. The fixation is augmented. We have a wider but buttressing effect. Impaction is must because bone heals with compression and liver arm modification. That's why there is argument about your um, uh, intramedullary or extramedullary devices, but intramedullary is more beneficial in osteoporotic fractures. But the most important is supplementary medical treatment, which we have already covered in the last webinar, as well as the implant selections. Resistance against bending load in block in lock plates. The plate screw connection is solid. Screw bone interface fails as a unit. That is the advantage of this lock plate because it fails as a unit. So it needs greater force for failure, greater load for failure. Failure is also present when you are using unicortical screws, which may be beneficial in your young age, but unicortical screws, they fail in osteoporotic as well as because there is less cortical thickness. And always choose the screws with the biggest diameter, with the largest possible diameter. So regarding the biomechanics, just a pictorial graph to show you that in normal bone or in non-osteoporotic young bone, you get, you take more load, 600 newtons, more than 600 newtons. Please conclude a, within one minute. Okay, so thank you. So, and then concepts of plate fixation in osteoporotic bone is you need compression technique, bridge plate thing should be useful. Neutralization plates are useful, long plate for bone protection and biocortical screw fixations. So you can augment with calcium, uh, by means uh, this uh, PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate, the bone cement, the calcium phosphate. If bone is very poor, consider prosthetic replacement and never forget the soft tissue because as the fracture, as the bone is also aged, the soft tissue is also aged. So never forget the soft tissue. Concluding, I must say that osteoporosis is a still underdiagnosed uh, disease. Osteoporotic individuals require stable fracture fixation, augmentation by cementing techniques or employing additional hardware such as axillary plates, your circle is wire, double plating technique, correct application of the basic principles of fracture fixation and the modern use of technology or implant technologies should be there. Surgical techniques like screw designs, supplement option effects, the result surgery is not a substitution for medical management. That is very important because medical management should be there as an adjuvant therapy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your patience here. Thank you, Professor Chinmay, for basically emphasizing that enduring fracture fixation is important and basic principles cannot be overlooked or compromised. Now is the turn of Professor Manish Khanna. 
Professor Sir. Manish Khanna is a true leader in the field of rheumatology. He has been there since the founding days of Indian Orthopedic Rheumatology Association. He continues to be advisor of IORA. He is professor and head of the department of a medical college, which is an autonomous body at Ayodhya also. And most importantly, regarding his contribution to rheumatology, he has edited and written a book on rheumatology. So three cheers to Dr. Manish Khanna for his continued interest in the subject of rheumatology. And so much, over and above, he also has started a fellowship program in rheumatology. Professor Khanna, he Thank speaks so on what to be remembered. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. So uh, without wasting time, just going to start. See, uh, I think a uh, lot of uh, young orthopedic surgeons, osteoporotic hip fracture is a window actually for osteoporosis most of the time requiring a surgical intervention because the wrist osteoporosis does not always require. Hip is very fragile, we all know, and it is actually very well explained in the beginning also. We are missing and we are seeing a lot of osteopenic hip fractures. It is in the increasing trend. It again needs a proper study. How much fractures we see in the osteopenic stage of the hip, which is a need of the hour and hope in the due course of time in coming years, we'll be able to do that. Now, a lot of the issues, why there are a lot of the issues are there with the proximal femur? Actually, it is notorious. Why it is notorious? Because entire body weight is passing to two small globes, which are having a less area and wearing the weight more. So it has a lot of uh, potential. Secondly, it is a wonderful ball and socket joint. And before attempting any surgery, we should think over it. We should plan to plan over it. It should not be taken as for granted that this is the basic bread and butter. We have to give a full movement to that particular hip. Thirdly, the most important thing has been emphasized in the last webinar and this webinar also, the things start from the OPD, from the indoor time. When the patient is coming with a hip fracture, definitely you're going to manage it very well in a three, four days of time. But definitely, please rule out important histories, nothing to uh, discuss it again. Only one, that anti-epileptic drugs is a very common thing which has been taken by many patients. And it, we all know that this drug has a lot of uh, changes in calcium and bony metabolism. So please, after the surgery, ask your medical colleague that what to be done now because you're going to start anti-resorptive and all the things. Thirdly, uh, rather fourth thing is most important that type 2 diabetic patients in the elderly age group, they turn into hypothyroidism most of the time. And hypothyroidism in a traumatic patient, we are not interested in a trauma patient to get TSH done before the surgery. But I will emphasize this thing that if it is a uncontrolled hypothyroidism, then it is going to lead to a lot of complications as a, a peripheral vasodilatation and different, different things which are not to be discussed in this topic. So the moral of the story is hip surgeries to be executed very carefully, just not thinking over it. That is hip surgery, just start zolonuric acid and go away. Now, most of the time we are planning osteosynthesis and that is to be done if the age is less and even if age is 60, 65 or 70 because the life expectancy is more. Now, very few points for the basic points for the resident, which may be uh, something very stupid, but it's very important to emphasize is age more than 60, the bell should ring in your mind. Whatsoever current technique we are planning to use for the osteosynthesis, I'm talking about osteosynthesis, maybe in trochanter, sometime in intracapsular also, your CC screw, your dynamic fixation, intramedical implant, even your hydroxyapatite screw to give a wonderful result. One should think that we are dealing with a living bone and making it with a compatible to the inert implant. That has to be taken care of right from the patient which is entering into the OT and coming it out. And that living bone is weak and fragile. So your assistant, your everything should be very cautiously managed. The result of the surgery depend definitely on bone quality and fracture pattern, which is we can't control on it, but definitely reduction, implant design, implant placement, moreover in osteoporotic hip is to be considered 
specifically just i place a point that even if you feel that it is a very much osteoporotic please try always you should give a valgoid reduction to the implant but please please try to give a better valgoid position to this osteoporosis hip so that when the patient is going to wear the weight there should not be a problem now this on the right side is definitely osteoporotic patient which was been operated many many years back this is not been used again but again there was a time when actually we don't use a intramedullary implant the right side case is uh, very vigorously managed lot of wires have been done very uh, you know a patient was uh, having a good your weight bearing was been done initially and there was a miss happening you can see here there was a time an extra medullary implant was the best thing but now we are using we all are using nothing tell about it that intramedullary as soon as we see a patient is osteoporotic we try to give intramedullary if it is possible but definitely one should remember high failure rates are again with the intramedullary implants implant screw placement and everything is very important so best would be to place both the type of extramedullary intramedullary as soon as you are confused whether because you are going to have a reduction we don't know actually so for the bigger center definitely it is a thing but still many orthopedic surgeon are at periphery level working there with lot of the things to be required so please make it a habit we indians are now moving ahead to the western world that to place all the extramedullary and intramedullary implant at the same time because if it is a undisplaced fracture then definitely you will look over for the bone stock and before operating please ask take a proper history whether it is undisplaced with a proper bone stock because the impact was less or the impact was more because if the impact was more in its undisplaced the bone stock is good but if the impact was less with the travel history and you feel because every time it's not possible to go for a ct scan and this and that so you have to work it up accordingly on those levels which we miss most of the time similarly if it's a displaced fracture and if you're making it to reduce it so again most of the time you have to work up on the bone stock to see whether the bone stock is sufficient to take it as i have already mentioned ct is not possible but at least a x ray of the other hip can help you out because getting a x ray done of a lateral view is also not possible because of the pain but at least on the other view can help you out especially if it's you are dealing with a pathological fracture because you never know that at that particular site i think everybody is taking point that particular site whether the uh, lesion was there or not so we land up with the failures comminuted lateral wall and all those things i'm sorry for this uh, slide uh, which is very unclear definitely we should plan if possible for the intramedullary but have to be enthusiastic and need not to tell to go for a definitely medical management implant loosening is a normal problem and that has been there with all the implant but for the dhs it is a big thing definitely we have to work upon the think over the wear debris because if you are feeling that it is osteoporotic patient it is going to have a wear debris induced osteolysis so either you plan a good therapy before going of weight bearing or you can see whether the weight bearing to be in mind so it comes with the experience and i think everybody will appreciate to this thing for example i placing this of one of my error uh, a subtrochanteric fracture which was being reduced very enthusiastically literally he was not been taken and unknowingly uh, it was been fixed uh, with a little displacement so here again the patient when come we we found it after one month of time that it is undis it is having a little displacement so we are not we have not gone for a revision but we made it to unite somehow so proper osteoporotic means you have to work it up very properly refractures are there in osteoporotic patient which we need to work up properly similarly in the to conclude in sir, one minute one minute sir uh one thing i would like to emphasize that a good close reduction if possible can be attempted and i'm sorry to say even today's uh campbell is not having a good quote close reduction methods uh, like led better and bitman which we have studied in 7th and 8th edition so for all youngsters please try to respect that hip without having a more vigorous reduction go for these techniques to go for it and then uh, i think this is a long lecture which i have prepared but definitely a recent thing which i just want to emphasize before concluding is 3d print implant is now going to come because now we put a cement and then again osteoporosis and then again loosening and all those things are there we hope that with the 3d titanium pores coating which are available if your medical management is wonderful then you will be able to grow the bone in growth in these holes and you can lead to a very healthy bone gradually 
So uh, definitely these cementless estabular femoral components, titanium trabecular lattice is the next thing which is going to come and we're going to see, we're going to witness this and going to use it, but definitely to be using this, one should go through all these previous things and then to go for it. So now 2022 is there by 2050, all of us who are here, we're going to see a tremendous slice in hip fracture. So we have to take it very seriously if we want to give a wonderful good result. That is the nature of a human being and that is the thing to be served to the humanity. Thank you so much for your very patient care. Thank you, Professor Manish, for delving so very deeply into the various points worth remembering. And you have culminated rightly by saying that the future holds for further development in the field, including 3D implants. Friends, now is the regional presentation and none else than Professor Prakash P. Kotwal leads this uh, uh, section with his presentation on fragility fracture fixation around wrist and elbow. Before he makes his presentation, I must inform everybody that Professor Kotwal is presently Chairman, Institute of Orthopedic and Joint Replacement, Puspavati Singhania Research Institute, New Delhi. And everybody knows him that he has been ex-professor and head of the department orthopedics, Ames, Delhi, and he was there for almost 40 years. He was also trustee of AO Switzerland, representing India from 2010 to 2015. He has many laurels to his credit, including the three books we, which he has authored, and he has been the founder chairman of hand, hand section of of IOA. With this very brief uh, introduction, I request Professor Kotwar to make his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. Good morning, everybody. I am again grateful to Dr. Jha and Dr. Bhushan for giving me an opportunity to be a part of this uh, webinar. I'm going to speak on wrist and elbow. The fractures in the, uh, of the humerus in the elderly, earlier there was this Evans method of cuff, cuff and collar and all those things. Actually, it's gone all those days, we all know. The non-operative treatment may be appropriate in some patients because of the various reasons mentioned earlier, but they, that results in loss of motion and unsatisfactory function. And therefore, ORIF is the gold standard, but may not be possible in all, uh, all the patients uh, which are elderly and have uh, osteoporotic bones. So the, of course, some of that has already been uh, this thing. I will skip up very quickly through this. The challenges are osteoporosis, osteopenia. They are highly comminuted fractures uh, with articular fragmentation. That often leads to implant failure, may lead to non-union. Osteotomy of the uh, olecranon sometimes may lead to non-union. There may be infection, uh, stiffness, and associated conditions such as uh, rheumatoid or the other comorbidities. So the uh, classical uh, fracture of the distal humerus uh, with, uh, in the osteoporotic bone with comminution, it uh, requires an open direction and internal fixation. And one may be able to get a good fixation and restoration of the, of the anatomy. And this is the result uh, at the end of about six months or so. However, the non-union is also a problem in these bones and uh, the implant failure and therefore, this requires a large bone graft perhaps to uh, restore the column and may require total elbow replacement in certain situations. However, if the CT scan shows that the medial column is missing. Uh, so the, what was done was we took a large tricortical graft from the iliac crest, reconstructed the medial column and fixed it with, uh, with the plates and screws. And at the end of eight months, this was the union and that was the or functional result. The open direction internal fixation, as I said, maybe is the best, I think, but may have less predictable results, particularly because of the osteoporosis. There is metaphysical comminution, and of course, sometimes the poor soft tissue conditions, uh, conditions as well, as mentioned by Professor Chen Das. 
and therefore there may be limited tolerance of uh, for the joint immobilization and therefore then came the uh, this thing for total elbow replacement in in trauma so this actually became an extended uh, indication and with an aging osteoporotic population which are not amenable to osteosynthesis may requirement uh, may require replacement more often and there are more than uh, many uh, references which are supporting this theory so this is a classical example of a fracture distal end of humerus in an osteoporotic bone which is not united and there are some associated comorbidities as well and therefore this requires uh, a total elbow replacement and very quickly these steps so this is the position that you um, uh, approach uh, the, you proceed by then for the posterior approach you would there are many ways to do this but i prefer to do the take out a chip of the olecranon along with the triceps and you reflect it up and you now expose the distal end of the humerus so make an entry into the humerus with the gadgets and then there is this jig so you make a cut around the jig this jig is actually into the lower end of the humerus and uh, then you put the uh, trial implant, make some measurements about your the final implant to be selected. Then after having done the humerus, the, you, uh, you go on to the, to the ulna and make an opening into the ulna. That's the head of the radius, which actually may not be uh, necessary to excise in all cases. And uh, this is the preparation done for the ulna. And that's the uh, humeral prosthesis in place. So after putting the ulnar prosthesis as well, uh, you it is generally done cemented. Then you put back the, the tip of the olecranon and take some sutures with this thing. In about two weeks, immobilization is good enough. After that, you can start the mobilization. This is the result of the prosthesis uh, post-op X-ray. And this can be the reasonably good functional result, flexion, extension, and, and rotation at the elbow after total elbow replacement. Uh, this was a case which was osteosynthesis done elsewhere and uh, even the osteotomy, this thing is uh, not united perhaps and uh, there was an implant failure and uh, this actually, this was the uh, done outside, then somebody removes those implants, there must have been infection, so then they put these wires and uh, that this time he came to us. So we undertook this, we removed all the, these wires and implants and did a thorough debridement. And uh, subsequently, because there was uh, non-union at the osteotomy site, so we did a, after the infection got controlled, we did a bone grafting and plating for the ulna because we were planning to do a total elbow replacement and you need an intact ulna to, put, to take the ulnar prosthesis. And, uh, after the plate removal, then we took him for total elbow replacement. So this was the total elbow replacement done. This was at the end of four or five surgeries, total three that we did. And this is his result at the end of about three months. So he had a full range of uh, movement. Of course, the total elbow replacement is also associated with, in with these complications, uh, of the deep infection, neuropathy, ulnar neuropathy, particularly triceps insufficiency in multiple operated cases. There can be instability as well, and uh, fatigue fracture of the implants, bone loss, and peripathetic fractures, as occurs with other uh, joint replacements as well. So, the now coming to the distal uh, radius. So this is the incidence of uh, fragility fractures is also rising because the, the age of uh, occupant, this thing is uh, increasing. The most frequent upper extremity fracture in women over 50 years of age and the fracture of the distal radius generally occurs before even the hip or the uh, vertebral fractures. Although the, we all know and we treat most of the distal radial fractures with close reduction and POP cast, but uh, and they are good, they work well in displaced and uh, unreducible fractures or stable fractures. And therefore, it is still the commonest method in India. And this is how uh, one can treat them. But sometimes you definitely need, for example, in osteoporotic, this kind of displaced uh, distal uh, radius fractures 
Uh, and if you see a, see the CT scan, it will show many things. It will show that there is so much of comminution here. And you can see this because of the spongy bone and the osteoporotic bones, there, there occurs a metaphysical void. And if this, not is, uh, this is not filled up, the conservative method will cause collapse uh, at the end of six weeks or eight weeks and reduction uh, would be lost. So therefore you need to go in and uh, fix it with the plate and sometimes you have to also use bone substitutes to uh, fill up that metaphyseal void. Are the osteoporotic fractures behave differently? Yes. There is this, this is the paper and this is a, depending upon the T score, minus two, minus 2.5. And if, if you notice this, this one is for osteoporosis, this is for the osteopenia, and this is for the normal. So in all the, uh, the uh, parameter, that is the early instability, malalignment and malunion, they are definitely more common, particularly in, in osteoporotic fractures. So osteoporosis does affect the uh, fractures in the distal radius. So it has a negative impact, osteoporosis, as I said, because uh, on the clinical outcomes, there can be loss of fixation, late displacement, and changes in the, in the volar tilt. The technically demanding fractures are the osteoporotic fractures with the rim fractures. As you can see here, this is the, the distal fragment is too small, and this does need uh, a support by help of a plate. So how are you going to do this? This is the, the fracture line, which is actually very distal. So distal fragment is really very, very small and it cannot take the screws if I normally put the uh, through the plate. And the CT scan will show you the uh, further details about the, uh, the dimensions of the distal fragment. So what generally is also, this is a technique that what you can do is instead of putting the screws to the distal fragment, you can put a, a pin, uh, a circlage wire, you can bend it and put it into the into the distal fragments and then hold it. Uh, this wire is held with the help of a, of a locking plate or an otherwise uh, plate. So now what will, this is how it will look on the X-ray. So you are now holding the distal fragment with the help of the pin and this is now being supported with the help of a, of a plate and you can get a good result. Another problem with osteoporotic fractures is, is this. Uh, this was a fracture, comminuted fracture here was initially fixed with uh, an, ex uh, an external fixator. A good reduction was achieved and the plan was to go in and uh, do a plating. So as the plating was in progress and as the pin was removed, it, uh, there occurred a fracture uh, in the proximal uh, to the plate. So then again, uh, another plate had to be put in uh, to fix that fracture. And obviously you overlap the plate to avoid the stress riser between the uh, two plates. Another technique, particularly for these kind of very grossly comminuted fractures in osteoporotic bones, and this is the distraction plating. So without opening the fracture site, you go in and put a plate, which actually is fixed into the metacarpal and into the, into the proximal fragment, uh, proximal to the fracture line. And this is called as distraction plating, and then it leads to uh, good union, good uh, anatomical restoration, and the plate is removed after about two to three months. I personally have no experience with this technique, but it is definitely very much in use. There is this article in 2012 where people have used uh, this method uh, for the comminuted fractures of the distal radius. And even now also, even another article in 2015 where this technique has been used with with good um, successful results. So to conclude, I would say that the incidence of osteoporosis uh, related fractures is increasing. We all know, we have talked about it. The conservative treatment does have a role wherever it is possible, but it is best treated by external fixator or open reduction and non-fixation and maybe replacement wherever it is indicated. But please remember, do not forget to treat the osteoporosis. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Professor Kotwal. And you rightly said that the time deduction at source by yourself was so very important. You finished it five minutes earlier. The message is loud and clear. And you have specifically mentioned about fractures which have bag of bones. So thank you. Thank you very much. May I now invite the next speaker, Dr. Su Professor Subir Mukherjee. He has been professor and head of the department in his medical college at Raipur 
and subsequently he rose to become vice chancellor of the medical university in Chhattisgarh. Professor Subir, are you there? I'm very much here, sir. Yes, so. But I just do not know whether I'm audible or visible for that uh, matter. Uh, your slides are visible. You are also visible and uh, I think you can share. If there is any difficulty, I am there. I should be of help. Okay. This is the problem with me, actually. As far as this is concerned, I treat myself as an sir, what, Sir, what you need to do is that you need to open your presentation, not on uh, screen share, but just open your presentation on your desktop. And then you will be able to click once this screen appears. Okay. So you can unshare right now, open your presentation, and then you can share again. Stop share first. This is the biggest problem. Just stop share career. Apna presentation up your desktop for a bar call slideshow mode and then once you share again you will reach that presentation and you can just click it and it will show a top may stop share hai it is on the top there is a new share uh, stop share stop share ko click karke pehle band kar lijiye maybe sir stop share yes uh, yeah, yes, now you are back. Apna presentation up your desktop. Pe kholi hai, sir. Main khol dun kya? Unka presentation mere paas bhi hai. Ah, ah, please, please, sir. Yeah, please do that, sir. Oh, okay, okay, I will okay. do that. Press, so press, I'm, press. I'm sharing the screen. Now I am going to. Okay. Let me find out his presentation. Please do. No, no, no. Dr. Subir Mukherjee was past president of, uh, is past president of Central Zone also. And uh, he has been very much educative and he has been offered many orations at many places. And I have attended also a couple of conferences under him. And I must thank him that uh, the governor of Jharkhand, who is a friend of him, he has uh, steered us to his uh, inaugural address. So many uh, prime ministers are known to Professor Kotwa. All right. Now, unfortunately, your presentation, I am also again not able to open. So, what to in, do, sir? I mean, okay. So, in the meantime, I will request. Uh, uh, skip it for next presentation. <coughs> and in the meantime, Mohit Aroda, are you there? Yes, sir, I'm here. Okay, so Mohit will make his presentation uh, uh, on fracture fixation in pediatric osteoporosis. And Mohit, uh, you you tell yourself where you are working these days. Uh, sir, I'm, uh, hello all, good morning everyone. I'm Dr. Mohit Arod. I'm working in uh, W. Pratiksha Hospital, which is a corporate yes. hospital in Burgaon. I'm working as a pediatric orthopedic surgeon there. Uh, so I'll be presenting, uh, shall I start the sharing screen, sir? Right. Right. So is it visible? Yes, very much visible. So good morning all. My topic is uh, fracture fixation in pediatric osteoporosis. So in this slide, I'll be talking about various implants that are used in children suffering from pediatric osteoporosis slash osteomalacia, having deformities, dysplasias, and in post-traumatic conditions also. So first of all, uh, uh, as we talk about the pediatric osteoporosis, uh, the primary pediatric osteoporosis, which is osteogenesis imperfecta, mostly encountered in our uh, outpatient department. There is a telescopic intramedullary nail system, which has been developed uh, for patients suffering from OI, skeletal dysplasias, and other bone deformity. It's a self-extending rod. 
So the principle is based on uh, the concept created by Sofield and Miller. It said that uh, the uh, we do uh, corrective osteotomies of the long bone deformities through mu at multiple levels and which are divided into several fragments and they are subsequently fixed by inserting a fixed size rod. Initially, there was a concept of fixing it with a fixed size rod. But then as the children, as the bone lengthens with the age, they have to do undergo multiple surgeries. Hence, they developed a, a two component rod system, which can slide over one another that enable telescopic modification. And uh, this is indicated for children uh, 18 months or older suffering from OI pseudoarthrosis and can be used concomitantly with external fixators in older children also, short statured adult with uh, limb length discrepancy. So the most common uh, ro telescopic rod used is phasia dual rod, which has a female component which sits at the top on the proximal epiphysis and the male component sits at the bottom and fixed to the distal epiphysis. So it uh, has been designed for femur, tibia and humerus and uh, made of stainless steel grade, uh, which is 316L and available in various diameters. So this is the uh, phasia dual rod. So the female, female component sits on the proximal epiphysis and the male at the distal epiphysis. Now, uh, coming over to the hip deformities, there are various kind of uh, locking pediatric osteotomy plates. It's a system composed of plates, blades, connectors, locking screw, polyaxial and compression screws, and the instrumentation. So basically, uh, they come in uh, various angles, and they are uh, for deformities for the coxa velga vera. Now, indications are uh, to correct the deformity in all the three dimensions. The first one is a coronal plane that is inter and subtrochanteric valgus or varus osteotomy. Then there is a transverse plane derotation osteotomy, and then it is in sagittal plane flexion and extension osteotomy. They can even be used in intertrochoid subtrochanteric fracture. So this is the uh, plate, and uh, for the coxa valga, and the uh, on the right side is the plate for the coxa vera. Now the certain plates are available for the distal femoral osteotomies also. Sometimes we use locking plate. Uh, the other one we can use is DCS also. Now, uh, coming over to the knee, uh, the, there is a concept in uh, knee ME epiphysiodesis, which is known as guided growth. It's a surgical technique used to gradually correct angular limb deformities in skeletally immature patients. It's an option, it's a surgical option and alternative to corrective osteotomies which can be done only after uh, physial closure. It is associated with less pain, shorter immobilization, decreased cost, and less surgical risk. Now, it can be done by plating or stapling, but uh, there it comes with a few complications like premature physial closure, a rebound period of accelerated growth or hardware, hardware migration uh, uh, that we have to uh, tell the patient when we, are in, uh, when we are doing this surgery. The complications appear to be lower using the extra periosteal two-hole plate method, which is commonly used nowadays. Now, two-hole plate with a parallel screw configuration appears to be more efficient in slowing growth than divergent screw uh, configuration. And screw size and plate size have not been shown to affect the rate of angular correction. So this is a pictorial depiction uh, of the deformity correction. So basically, in, uh, this is a child with a genu welcome deformity where the growth is more on the medial side of the distal femur. So basically what we are going to do is we're going to put a plate on the medial side of the distal femur so that it uh, slows the growth on that side and such, so much so that the uh, growth on the lateral side catches up and there is a correction of the deformity in the coronal plate. Now, two types of plate, I, uh, they are um, uh, in the market. So first one is a hinge plate. So basically where there is a hinge between the two holes and the other one is a, a, a normal eight plate. Now, for the ankle deformities, uh, there are lots of plates uh, that come uh, for correction in the ankle deformities, uh, medial and anterolateral, both the sides. Uh, now, the transphysial locking screws. So basically, uh, they have got a smooth tip to allow crossing of the femoral head epiphysis, which little risk of arresting growth. So multiple smooth tip lengths to account for position in the femoral head epiphysis as the epiphysis height is greater, greatest at the apex and decreases as you move away from it. Now, the ability to cross physis allows the spanning of proximal femoral lesion like uh, bony cyst in the proximal femur, which do not typically involve the epiphysis. Now, a lot of plates are available for the foot deformities uh, as in conditions such as cavus foot, flat foot, club foot or helix valgus. Um, uh, just like a uh, railroad fixator, there are mini rail external fixator available uh, to correct the deformities in open fractures or deformities in children also. 
Now, there is another uh, apparatus which is called as hexapod, which uh, can be used to correct the complex multiplanar deformities. And of course, uh, we can use Elizaros also. Uh, the Elizaro type of frame, they provide higher rigidity in axial and bending loading, while the hexapod frames are uh, more rigid in torsional, torsional loading. Taylor spatial frame is one of the hexapod uh, system. Now, there is another concept, computer hexapod assisted orthopedic surgery. So basically what we do is, it's a method to achieve the intraoperative correction of a long bone deformity using an hexapod external fixator. Before we do definitive internal fixation with minimal, minimally invasive stabilization technique. So basically, what we use is we use a computer software to uh, span to span out the deformity that is to be corrected. Then we put a, a hexapod uh, on the uh, involved bone. We correct the deformity. We let the hexapod to be there. Then we do a minimal fixation either in the form of nail or plate. We uh, do the minimal fixation. After that, we remove the hexapod. Now, in other conditions like pathological fractures, we can use tense nail also, Ender's nail, K wires, pediatric DHS, rush nail, oblique square nail, like in forearm fractures. Now, another uh, implant used in uh, children, specifically in uh, those with pelvic osteotomies, are bioresorbable K wires, which are made up of bioresorbable polylactic acid. Now, it has got a half life of approximately six months, and a complete resorption takes place in approximately three to five years. Now, it has got certain advantages. Basically, it retains its fixation strength until well after biological healing is complete. And there is a, <clears throat> a very gradual decline of strength over time, which allows for a similar slow decrease in stress shielding that is transferred to the biological healing process. There is obviously a decreased risk of bacterial colonization as we bury the wire inside the skin. And there is no need for the second operation to remove the hardware that if become uh, symptomatic. Thank you. Yeah, sir, you are muted. Thank you, Mohit, for Thank you, sir. making your presentation skillfully and within time. Yeah, I, I Subir, tried to make it very brief, sir. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. So, Professor Subir, now, now is your presentation. I am uploading it. Subir, Professor Subir. Professor Subir, are you there? Yes. Subir, sir, you are muted. We can't hear you. Unmute Professor you Subir, you are muted. Is it correct now? Right. So okay. I, I will go ahead. Right, sir. Uh, we are all uh, aware that uh, bone failure and not influent failure defines the challenges of osteoporotic fracture fixation. And it is a disease-driven alteration in structural bone properties, substantially weaker in plant fixation in osteoporosis. As bone mass decreases, so does the holding power of a screw. <laughs> Is it okay? Yes, yes, okay. Proceed. Yes, sir. Next, please. <clears throat> right. See, these are the various risk factors uh, females as a gender, obesity, sedentary individuals, polypharmacy, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, dementia, previous falls of fractures, no BMD. And in our region, it is the osteopathy, which is also very important. We have encountered many patients who have gone for treatment by osteopaths. They come out with very osteoporotic proportion of the bone. Next, please. Now, coming to the ankle, these are the three types of fracture, either the unimalleolar, bimalleolar, or trimalleolar fracture, but there are also supramalleolar fractures. Imaging plays a very important part, and we must go for AP lateral and mortis views, and atlases complete tomography. 
goal of the treatment is to return to pre injury functional level isolated undisclosed malignant fractures without evidence of disruption of syndesmotic ligaments a non operative full weight bearing walking cast or cast base is preferable and unstable fracture patterns with bimanual or trimanual fractures or unimanual with a talar displacement should be reduced and if reduction is stable long leg cast be applied to control rotation for initial 3 4 weeks professor mukherjee is there a second device seven second device also open there yes sir he is logged in from two devices i have yeah, seen so we need to uh... stop one and continue with the other right next please these are the various uh, fixation techniques let us see this is Conventional and good BMD locking, which creates a fixed angle with the stud and not dependent on BMD, and with syndesmotic screws in displaced mortise or talar tape. Tension band wiring, uni or bicortical cancel screws is commonly done. Now, if we have fibular intramedullary nail, particularly with uh, long nail, they have to get a better. chance of uh, stability at the site take many cases dr mukherjee take half a minute professor mukherjee take half a minute close your another device continue on only one device or at least mute the other one mute the other one right continue continue okay right treatment you are muted muted professor mukherjee you are muted you have muted the correct one unmute yourself unmute yourself professor mukherjee is it correct yes okay go ahead go ahead so orthotics is commonly done calcaneal calcaneal tibial component or at times surgical fractures external fixation in the charge of tissue augmentation by both cement calcium phosphate or screw anchors can be used next is These are the various uh, types of tapes that are available for fixation, and the uh, newer designs that have come up and uh, better quality of implants have helped us properly stabilize the fractures. Now we talk of some bone augments. Uh, bone cement increases overall material density, but uh, improves the screw purchase. But it does not absorb and has an isothermal reaction, leading to thermal necrosis. That is a disadvantage. Fibrillation, cross-stitch, and other things. Because of conductive bending, that is constantly being caused with fluid and bone, which may fracture something in long phase. Which includes bending strength and anti-bending. These are the plates that are used. So when the log plates, so very very hard. That uh, now we have got some solution to the stabilizing of these uh, very weak bones. Uh, the advantage is that it sees the focus of fracture stability of the screw plate interface. It offers good stability. Fixed angle device being played, and so the system is going to be displaced. Again, these are the various plates and the plausible. We have been using successfully for the fixation of these fractures. We have made possible how to do it. We also go for interval nailing with multiple screws when possible. So we see that uh, 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 fractures are only have three components. 
So the dilution component and the beta dilution component, which is the beta filament, becomes more green. As we are again uh, nailing with uh, uh, nailing with two fixations, and uh, at times we will go for joint replacement. There are but definite uh, problems with the use of. Uh, Long plating that fixed angle design results in increased stress at screw bone interface and high stiffness of plate that starts relative to low stiffness of weak bone generates stress riser effect, predisposing to peri implant fracture and bending loads. Other problems are replacement of outermost log screw with traditional screws improves bending strength by 40%. Without affecting the ability of the plate to withstand torsional or compressive loads. Next. Next. And fixed angle stability eliminates micro motion in comminuted fractures, particularly in periarticular regions, leading to non union up to 19%. And far cortical locking reduces construct stiffness without compromising strength. And this construct is 54% stronger in torsion, 21% in bending, and 84% under compression against standard locking. Alternative to far cortical locking, near cortical slots also reduce the same construct stiffness, maintaining fracture stability. The cost, however, is much, much higher. Now, in nailing that is done for uh, diaphysial femoral fractures, they have changed the shape and design of the uh, screw so that it is a blade like and gives a better stability. And placement of uh, multiple interlocked screws at multiple planes which also is helpful and, and augmented with a newer design of a blade like. This is the blade like that. And finally, we have uh, seen that uh, there is a, a skeletal repair system, an injectable fast setting carbonated appetite cement, which is used to fill defects in areas of compromised cancerous bone during restoration of augmentation of the skeleton. It hardens to form the halide, which closely replicates the mineral phase. Thank you very much. Right, Professor Subir. But for the sound disturbance, your presentation uh, was, sorry was excellently was. illustrated. Now I request uh, Dr. Amarnath, Dr. S.S. Amarnath, for his presentation on fragility, fracture, fixation, and joining root joints. I am stopping sharing. Yes. Dr. Amarnath, please. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Jair. I'm going to be sharing the screen now, and then I will be uh, coming on. Just a second. So are you able to see the screen? Uh, yes, now. And is it in the presentation mode now? Uh, not in the full screen. Make it full screen. Yes. Now? Yes. Now? Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the introduction, uh, Dr. Jair. And uh, to talk about uh, today's uh, uh, topic, uh, just a minute. Uh, uh, I'm just going to be sorting out the phone here. Which is okay. Uh, okay. Now so that's I, done. I, in fact, did not forgot to introduce uh, Dr. Amarnath. As is evident here, he is the director, Geriatric Orthopedic Association of India. And from its inception, he has been instrumental in taking this geriatric association forward. Thank you, Dr. Amarnath. Proceed. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, Dr. Jha, for uh, giving the uh, opportunity for this. Thanks, sir. For this and this is the org, these are the organizations that I am uh, involved with. Uh, I thank all the organizations for actively, uh, you know, contributing for orthopedic uh, work. Just a minute, I'm going to be logging on to this video. Okay, now, 
this is extremely important for us. Fractures around the root joints. What are we talking about? The root joints are the two joints which uh, uh, probably we all know as takes around the hip and the shoulder, which attaches itself to the upper limb and the lower limb. So extremely important point. Now, these slides are going to be covered uh, by many orthopedic surgeons who have spoke about. There are points that will be, uh, you know, uh, coming as a common feature to all of us. This is a highlight to tell the young and the seasoned orthopedic surgeons to highlight these particular points. Hence, this is where we are. And we're talking about in 2050. Why are we talking about 2050? In bone and joint decade, even before the bone and joint decade, the IOF have shared these slides for us and then we've been actively working towards this. We don't want to see this and we want to disprove this, you know, uh, the uh, statistics. This is where we stand now and this is our responsibility to make sure we do not get this in India, you know? So this is where we are focusing on. Then we all know this, right? I mean, with the fracture hip coming in, if I had prevented a fracture, when, when I treated a fracture with the wrist, a simple fracture of the wrist, I would have not seen this. So this is, if I'm seeing this, my responsibility is not fully taken care. Hence, that's extremely important for us to prevent it. Dr. Manish talked about, the, all other doctors talked about this. Extremely important. Now, diagnosis, how do we make it? Just with history, we can come to a conclusion what the person has it. Hence, I'm not going to keep and talk about each and every point that it's very visible. And history taking is one of the biggest, biggest parameter. Like in any other condition, it's more so in osteoporosis. Extremely important make sure that we all take this very important point there. And obviously there are more to it. So when once we elaborate, we get bigger details. Now with the investigations, you and I are planning for a surgical event, then obviously we are going to be doing many other blood tests. Similarly, we need to look at bone markers. Why? The bone markers are also a part of assessing how a person, the patient is responding, whether you're using an osteoplastic one or are, are you going to be using an osteoplastic? So hence that is very important for us. Apart from this, these are depending on the sex of the patient, like male or female, choose, and then we are gonna do that anyway, because we need to make sure the patient is not suffering from uh, the cancer so that we can avoid the osteoblastic treatment. In the urine, a simple urine test and probably NTX, or if not, Benz Jones can be done very easily. So keeping that in mind as a baseline, which has been talked about in the medical management, I'm gonna come around the shoulder. Shoulder, if I were to have a fracture in the upper limb, uh, outstretched hand falling in a standing height or a sitting height, I put my hand down. So from the finger fracture to metacarpal to wrist, distal radius, elbow to shoulder, any fracture can happen, right? So we're talking about the root, root joints now. In the root joints, what's happening, we need to make sure that you make sure what kind of fractures come into shoulder. Now, this fracture can be classified by nearest classification. You could do a AO classification. It doesn't matter. End of the day, am I treating this particular fracture? surgically, conservatively, that's extremely important. Now, in a one or two part fracture, you may want to treat conservatively, no problem. There are studies which has been done, even three part fractures have been treated, four part fractures being treated conservatively. So, but anyway, let us talk on the surgical part and let us see how we move around here. In this kind of fractures, the undisplaced fractures, you may want to treat cons I mean, conservatively, absolutely fine. You don't need to fix every, the moment you see a fracture doesn't mean that we should go and put a knife and then open it up and then make it worse. No, we want to give the best treatment available for that particular patient. Now, the different kind of fractures, it could be displaced. Now here, why I'm highlighting here, when we take an AP view, we also talk about the lateral view. You can't 
make a patient with this kind of fracture to lift his arm or lift her arm. So hence, we take an X-ray box coming here from the opposite shoulder, transthoracic view to understand because everybody may not be available to go to a CT scan or MRI and then costly investigations. Here we can, with the two different views, AP and a transthoracic, we can understand where the other fractures are, uh, other fragments are. This is a very uh, posh one, if people can afford, nothing like it, 3D. And then come to fixations. Fixation can be a simple K wire, simple, you know, uh, ordinary plates and screws. But in osteoporosis, we're talking about a free loss, you know, proximal humerus locking plates. Now, this is highly technical. And we also make sure that the joints are aligned for the shoulder to move around properly so that we properly fix it with interfragmentary screws and the phyllos plate with holds the fracture properly. Now, today we talk about you know, proximal humeral nailing. In fact, in Gossicon in November, we are going to have a workshop on this, proximal humeral nailing, and this coming in a big way. So one needs to have a technique, what one is used to, one is familiar, what can be done in the given set setting that they are working with and give the best for the patient, that's extremely important. What I mean is know your limitation. That's one thing. If I have chance to take an assistance with somebody, I will do it. That's what you should be focused on. So let's focus on the hip joint. Hip joint fractures, obviously, we have missed so many, you know, time to prevent this fracture for him or her. It could be intracapsular, it could be extracapsular, pertrochantric, comminuted trochantric, subtrochantric, stable, unstable fractures in the hip. End of the day, you need to make sure that we need to fix it, right? So let us understand what Manish also told about, very, very important, like other orthopedic surgeons also talked about, is to x ray both the hip joints in a pelvis, not just one. So that's very important for us. We may miss the other fracture in the other hip probably. So hence, in hip fractures, you need to have a pelvis X-ray properly and a spine X-ray if possible without moving the patient. Extremely important. Now, uh, different fractures, different patterns, stable, unstable. Yes, I'm not going to get into full details there. In an undisplaced or minimally garden one, garden two type, we can do a minimal uh, what we call it as a cannulated screws, which is extremely good and it has stood the test of the time. But what we need to be careful here is not to pierce into the joint because that's where if it cuts through, then we are getting into a different zone. So first time around, we need to make sure that we fix it. Whether you choose intermedullary or extramedullary, what is your expertise? What is it you have in the system, in your... Uh, you know, a facility where you're working. You and I need to keep both available because you never know when what doesn't work and then we can't wake up the patient and say, I'm sorry, I had this, so I'm gonna redo that, no chance. Today we are talking about 21st century with medical legal issues coming in a massive way. You and I need to uh, make sure that we're practicing the legal medicine at the same time, what is ethical. So that's the very important key point here to understand. And you may be, you know, an expert in doing a sliding screw, nothing wrong in it, but make sure choosing the right implant, right fracture, and the right type of expertise is extremely important. Yeah, I'm highlighting this. Now, you may also do what is called as a, you know, prosthesis, different types, you know, Austin Moore to Thompson, there are so many things come in. Is it in the dustbin now, or is it in the, uh, you know, uh, museum? Most likely, yes, but there are certain occasions we still use it, it is still there. Now, you could use a bipolar. So this is a bipolar, or you could do a hip replacement, primary hip replacement for a fracture. It all depends on the indication, whether you are doing it in a senior citizen or a super senior citizen. Senior citizen is between 60 to 80, a super is about 80 to 100. So all these things are coming in. But, but before we get into the surgical, you and I have been told time and again, and in the last meeting, this has been highlighted, extremely important. Osteomalacia correction is important. Hypercalcemia is there. Vitamins, many of us are forgetting. Protein, we're forgetting. So many of our patients have 
sarcopenia. So protein is a very, very important parameter. So make sure that. Coming to algorithm, I'm just going to talk about a very couple of points. These two are done by uh, uh, you know gynecologists. We talk about for the bisphosphonates, whether it is oral, injectable, I'm not going to get there. Calcitonin, please, please, surgeons, use it for pain only, not for osteoporosis. It's only the osteoporotic pain. PTH and bisphosphonates come to picture now. Now, we talk about in the osteoclastic, zoronic acid, 5-MG, IVE is the test of the day. It is very well documented with all the features. And mind you, we can do it as a daycare. And there is another option that we have, which is extremely important. We have denosumab. Do I use this? I would prefer, and a lot of studies also have shown zoronic acid is much better. But in terms of challenges that we are also facing with uh, the zoronic acid and the patient's compliance, the new kid in the block, denosumab, which is also almost 10 years plus now, can be used as a you know, Please subcutaneous. Please conclude. Yeah, it's finishing now. Osteoplastic treatment, yes, very important. Now, teriparatide comes to 20 microgram per day, 24 months exposure for every human being, very important. Why? This is a basic uh, biopsy done of a pelvis which had minus 2.5 osteoporosis in a T-score. Now, this is a plasticine model to highlight pre-treatment and post-treatment of 18 months. Imagine if you can grow, grow the bone like this, why you and I are thinking twice to treat. Now, fractures are there, but the responsibility is very, very important. The myths are also there. So you and I need to grow over it and take the responsibility as an orthopedic surgeon because it's extremely important and it's becoming a standard of care, not just other part of the world, in India as well. So with this, I will stop my presentation and the take home message is extremely simple. One, osteoporosis is a disease, has been nominated as a disease. Preventable, treatable, most importantly, reversible. So hence, thank you. Thank you folks for the time. Thank you, Dr. Share. Amarnath for talking about important fractures around root joints. The fracture which till recently or even now goes by the name of unsolved fracture needs a solution. Are we approaching or have we approached the solution to that above fracture which is unsolved? We will be discussing these points in our discussion. So now I request Professor Ravi Sauta, who is director and head in the Artemis Hospital, Gurgaon, for making his presentation on principles of orthogeriatric surgery care, fragility fractures of long bone. Professor Sauta, please. Thank you, Dr. Jha, for the opportunity. And uh, friends, uh, my take is on fragility fractures for the long bones. Uh, we are uh, going to be uh, we are going to be uh, talking about uh, that the fragility fracture about forty percent of the volume which you see worldwide is actually a fragility fracture with the orthopedic surgeons and it is very important time matters most of the patients should be operated within twenty four to forty eight hours for the lower extremity surgical management should be in such a way that early loading weight bearing is possible. For the upper extremity, patient, patients should be able to eat, have a self-care, grooming, and uh, other things possible. As far as the patient-related risk factors for the fractures are concerned, we all have still now known that the fragility fracture population is on the rise. Surgeon needs to be more of a gardener as opposed to the carpenter, which we generally uh, uh, you know, uh, come to uh, know and, and understand in our uh, understanding in our mind. The these patients are immunosuppressive, sarcopenic, which means their muscles are very very weak. They are on anticoagulants, comorbidity, polypharmacy. Frailty, frailty score is very very important for the outcome and complications, and there are very high risk of complications in these patients. 
Goal setting is simple, that these patients should be made pain-free. The functional restoration should be as early as possible. Patients should be able to do independent living and prevention of the complication, which are very common like pneumonia, bed sore, UTI, and delirium in these patients. These are EO principles which contribute for a successful fracture healing and are of equal importance without any order in preference in order to achieve the goal of early active pain-free mobilization. As far as the fragility fracture uh, principles for the elderly osteoporotic are concerned, as already emphasized, the principles of absolute, relative, and uh, absolute uh, uh, fixation in in patients relate uh, of osteoporosis prefer to have a relative fixation or what they call an absolutive fixation in the given situation indirect reduction which adds to the functional anatomy not exactly anatomical reduction lock splinting fixation long plates and nails which which are preferred load distribution and load sharing implants no interfragmentary compressions as they, they can increase the num, uh, amount of accommodation at the fracture site. Secondary bone healing uh, should be allowed for with the callus formation. Healing is not a problem in these patients and a com, uh, obviously combination of the principles in which absolute and deficits, uh, you know, close to the joint fractures may need a combination of principles. So as far as the principles are concerned, these are the simple principles of impaction, wide buttress, long splintage, augment your fixation, substitute your bone if required, possibly with the help of arthroplasty. These are the impactions, wide buttressing, long plates, and uh, cement augmentation for the implants. We should use a single shot surgery, preferably revision to be avoided, and if required, the arthroplasty may be considered. In a wide canal, very thin cortices, intramedullary implant with the polyaxial fixation in the proximal humerus in a 92-year-old, here is the case example, which gives a good solid fixation and goes on to unite. Another periprosthetic fracture in 75-year-old, just simple external fixator because the fracture is minimally displaced it goes on to heal without much interference as already emphasized by previous speaker that soft tissue is also fragile in these patients. So these are a few principles. Technique should be minimally invasive. Prefer to use a relative stability. Splint the bone, whole of the bone. Angular stable devices and blades are preferred uh, implants for fixation. Anatomical alignment no, and a functional reduction is very, very important in these patients. Uh, most important is uh, use of bone impaction techniques may accept a little bit of a shortening and also a little bit of a valgoid fixation rather than the valgus fixation, uh, varus fixation. Augment your fixation with the help of a bone substitutes, implants, or with the polymethyl methacrylate. Allograft wherever, autograft wherever possible, allografts wherever required, and bone substitution in the form of a replacement and a site-specific modifications may be required for different sites. This is a this is a 77 year old where there is a fixation of the proximal femur which has been done with the nail. It is a relative fixation. There is a fracture at the distal end leads to uh, another patient with the uh, relatively uh, less screw, long plate, less screw length, long working length for the implant, which gives you a, a relatively elastic fixation at the fracture site. It goes on to heal. Here is the stress riser. There are the two implants. There is a proximal implant in the hip. There is a periprosthetic fracture, which goes on to heal. There is a fracture at the distal end. So the mid, mid portion has been spanned. But unfortunately, uh, this goes on to, uh, you know, uh, goes on to uh, protection. And the, here is the uh, another patient where there is a fracture at the periprosthetic fracture. Proximal end ends up into a, uh, implant failure. Again, spanning of the whole bone, which we have already discussed, is very important in these patients. That also breaks and, and then intramedullary device comes to rescue and uh, it goes on to heal. 
as already emphasized that impaction of the proximal humerus is very important you you may accept a little less anatomical reduction but but it is reasonably functional and it goes on to heal with the help of these philos angular stable devices augmentation with the help of a spiral blade which uh, impacts the bone into the neck of the femur gives you a more stability and uh, and other options which we have today are to use the trauma sim or a cement bone cement in a fenestrated screws which help us improve the fixation in these patients here is a patient where polymethyl methacrylate has been used in through the fenestrated screws into the uh, proximal uh, humerus uh, for increasing the stability preventing the cutouts and uh, uh, further complication related to the fixation in the proximal femur again fenestrated screw tromosome has been used for stability here uh, there is an example where there is a backing out of the screw which was augmented with the help of a cement and it goes on to heal without any complication and problem here the technique of reconstruction using a fibular allograft if bone bank is available or you can use a fibular strut from the uh, patient's leg itself to improve the uh, stability because these uh, are not only add to the fixation they also add to the union uh, for these patients so when you talk of a site specific uh, specific modifications which may be required in the shaft intertrochanteric fractures proximal tibia and periprosthetic fractures and atypical fractures here there is a shaft humerus fracture comminution you can see the nail uh, which gets loosened out and then later on fixed with the uh, with the help of a philos here intermedullary nail uh, again it loosens out bone is uh, not accurately redu reduced around uh, further uh, fixation may be required to in order to do the proper stable fixation align the bone in proper position and later on it goes on to heal here there is a fracture which is a subtrochanteric uh, circlage wire which has been used generally uh, they give a good results but in a situations uh, sometimes it can uh, the comminution component lower part has united but one can see that there is a healing problem at the proximal which goes on to break uh, you know uh, implant failure and later on it was augmented by revision of the nail as well as the fixation with the additional plate and uh, uh, periprosthetic plate uh, fixation for the plate and eventually it again goes on to failure so uh, refixation with the in a slight valgoid position which goes on to heal with the use of a uh, teriparatide in these patients these are the patients again proximal uh, metaphyseal fracture in the tibia which is another new sense which we which we uh, face uh, uh, off and on in our practice proximal fibular uh, it can be augmented or strengthened with the use of a, a fibular strut to one more minute to improve the fixation similarly there is a uh, fixation which can be done in periprosthetic fractures uh, one can see on one side uh, nail has been used but uh, there is a failure of the nail and uh, again spanning of the bone was done another patient where proximal uh, uh, distal femoral periprosthetic fracture which was fixed and augmented with the multiple uh, intermediary uh, uh, you know fibular strut and uh, fixation with the devices this is a, a case of a atypical fracture uh, on alendronate for a long time again we know that there are minor and major criteria for uh, diagnosing the atypical fracture uh, again revision surgery was done with the help of a derotation plate bone grafting eventually it goes on to unite so friends the uh, techniques which are used for internal fixation in osteoporotic fractures the principal are to use uh, impaction use a wide buttress long splintage of the bone augment your fixation either with nail plate or a nail uh, with the cement or the plate with this uh, cement augmentation substitution of the bone can be done in the form of a replacement or arthroplasty uh, thank you very much uh, for your patient hearing uh, consider arthroplasty fixation should be used in a Mm, in the form of a nail mini invasive uh, fixation mini exposure lock plates bone grafting and augmentation and don't forget to treat osteoporosis as emphasized by uh, all these previous speakers thank you very much for your patient hearing thank you professor savta apart from discussing this diaphyseal fractures you have also emphasized 
on desirable desirability of extending the metaphysical fixations into the diaphysis and how stress risers can often spoil a nicely cooked implant fixation thank you thank you very much now friends is the time for talking on vertebral fractures which are so common as fragility fractures dr lalit gupta from gurugaon will be talking on fragility fracture fixation of vertebra dr L lalit i am sorry i have pronounced his name wrongly he is dr lalit kumar good morning sir yes morning good morning uh, can you hear my presentation yes 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 sir so uh, let's start uh, my presentation is uh, on the surgical intervention options in the osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures so uh, these are the silent fractures patient complains with the back pain without trauma or trivial trauma and they are uh, mostly goes unrecognized why they are important their importance can be assessed by the two consequences they have a higher mortality rate and morbidity compare even compared to the hip fractures in the same group of the patients and reasons for their uh, mortality morbidity is the complication related to the restricted lung activity lung function uh, chest complications pulmonary uh, complications dvt and pulmonary embolism so another uh, uh, consequence is the first vertebral fracture predict the risk of the future vertebral and non vertebral fractures which keep on uh, increasing exponentially 3 to 5 times in the next fractures and it should be differentiated from the other conditions for this like bony metastasis multiple myeloma hyperparathyroidism primary secondary malaria pager disease and the renal osteodystrophy investigations already covered just would like to tell that we have to take x ray whole spine ap and lateral view in standing view with the flexion and extension views uh, in the lateral view so that we can assess the instability mri is important to uh, rule out uh, undetected fractures and uh, the fractures which are not visible in the x ray and they are also useful for the uh, non union at the vertebral fractures bone scan are important for the like patients where mri is not possible and uh, the patients with the pacemaker implanted blood investigations already covered so i don't want to go on this one so classification uh, there are the many classifications like telix ao classifications and uh, uh, sugita classifications which has been but they have they have or advantages and disadvantages so uh, german society of orthopedics has proposed a classification which is based on the x ray and ct and mri so they have classified on the morphologically basis in the group 1 2 3 4 5 where 1 2 3 can be managed or the stable one can be managed with the uh, conservative treatment non surgically and 4 5 to be managed with the uh, surgically so one and two uh, classification based uh, uh, decision can be taken one and two can be managed conservative treatment three with a conservative and if does not uh, get better then we have to consider for the surgically four five must be considered for the surgical intervention so in non operative is uh, uh, management include the pain management and maximizing the functional outcome so indications are already discussed and uh, for the pain management we have the uh, acetaminophen and the paracetamol and muscle relaxant uh, patient note control use narcotics nsaids on the like uh, brufens diclofenac uh, various patches are available where the patients is not able to take orally and uh, calcitonin should be used only for the pain management in the early osteoporotic fractures like first four weeks of the uh, injury other uh, uh, methods are the orthosis uh, braces uh, taylor's braces hyper extension braces corsets corsets can be used physiotherapy is the important part hyper extension uh, extensions exercises should be 
uh, started once patients become pain free so that can be uh, osteoporosis and osteopenia muscle wasting and uh, related pains can be avoided in these cases surgical management two parts uh, is the vertebral augmentation which includes vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty and another is the uh, de uh, surgical decompression and stabilization where we have to consider for the vertebroplasty kyphoplasty all the patients should be considered uh, stable fractures with the uh, conservative in initially four to six weeks if the treatment is fail or patient does not get relief from the pain it should be considered for the vertebroplasty or, or uh, kyphoplasty so it can be considered early before six weeks if patient is not able to tolerate the braces and complaining the severe pain uh, kyphoplasty considered better better than the vertebroplasty uh, uh, with respect to restoration of the height of the vertebra, deformity correction, and less complication rate. Vertebroplasty have a, uh, uh, have a um, shown to mortality benefits compared to the conservative treatment group. So where we should not consider kyphoplasty, uh, asymptomatic fractures, fractures healing with conservative means, kyphosis without fracture, prevention of the fracture due to documented osteoporosis or prior fractures, uh, for the treatment of the secondary complications of the kyphosis, such as reduced pulmonary functions, we should not consider uh, kyphoplasty as a uh, treatment. And they are the associated with the complications, cement leak, cement embolization, local injury uh, caused by uh, caused uh, is the um, narrow or the cord injuries, hematoma and the infections, neurological symptoms related to these leaks, and uh, and uh, we should um, uh, not considered. Uh, where the neurological surgical backup is not available at the centers. We should avoid uh, vertebroplasty on those places. Contraindications are coagulation disorders, underlying infection, cement allergy, and uh, surgical decompression and stabilization is rare in the vertebral compression fractures, but in the type 5 where the instability is there or uh, persistent pain with the progressive kyphosis we should consider for the surgical decompression stabilizations. They are the various type of the uh, options available like anterior decompression, fixation fusion, posterior decompression, fusion fixation, anterior plus posterior, pedicle subtraction or short me combination of the of the above with the vertebral augmentations. This should be considered with the respect of the, the training of the patient, uh, uh, training of the surgeon in this area where he finds himself as a comfortable doing the kind of the surgery and patient's uh, problem. Like if it is more of the anterior one bust fracture can be considered with the anterior one, but majority of the uh, uh, surgical interventions can be managed with the posterior one only. So Chinese author has described the uh, grading criteria uh, for the uh, late uh, painful um, uh, osteoporotic compression fractures. Like they have divided into the five types depending on the uh, radiological uh, probe, uh, radiological presentations uh, and uh, with the patient's pain and the signs of the instability. So grade one, they, they have advised only for the uh, uh, vertebral augmentation on the only cementing in the grade two uh, in grade one there is a uh, only back pain and wedging deformation but no instability uh, in the type grade two they have uh, there is a low back pain with the wedging with the instability they have advised short fixation and uh, anterior vertebral augmentation in the type three uh, type 3, there is a back pain and there is a intermittent weakness, claudication or numbness. In that case, they have advised uh, for the fixation, augmentation and the decompression in these cases. In the type 4, as the uh, severity increases, where the instability is there with the neurological symptoms, with the kyphotic deformity, they have advised longer fixation. And uh, with the uh, uh, with the um, uh, with the uh, excision of the posterior uh, bony part, which is putting pressure, and uh, and and correction of the deformity. In the type five, uh, where the there is a mix of the symptoms is there with the symptoms with the instability with the degeneration. They have advised 
uh, with the long fixation with the anterior and posterior uh, fixation with the cement and the uh, all, all the like uh, osteotomy vcr all should be considered in this type of the fractures so these are also associated with the complications uh, like loosening of the implant proximal junctional kyphosis nerve cord injuries there are the contraindications active infections not fit for the surgery poor cardiopulmonary discharge to prevent the uh, complications there are the technical uh, aspect as well as the newer techniques available which should be considered for the prevention of the uh, failure of the fixations like increasing diameter of the uh, screw increasing the length small pilot holes and uh, different trajectories has been advised with the cortical trajectories expandables are the newer designs available cement augmentations and newer technique should be utilized with the combinations of the general surgical principles a uh, take home message is the surgical treatment group of the patient should be evaluated carefully before surgical management as they may have multiple comorbidities and high risk for the procedure and anesthesia surgical plan should be individualized based on the general condition of the patient fracture pattern and deformity severity of the osteoporosis extent of paralysis spinal cord uh, or neurological status single procedure may not be sufficient due to the poor quality of the bone combination of procedures should be considered and comprehensive plan in the view of duration of surgery experience of the surgeon and extensive ness of the procedure and adequate decompression fixation should be carried out and most important thing fully informed written informed written consent should be there before taking up any patients sir, thank you so much thank you, thank you so much ji sir sir lalit kumar you have uh, covered uh, almost all the aspects of it but there are more than 30 percent of the complications they occur after the fixation in the osteoporotic bone and uh, one is very well known about the facet joint sarcopathy uh, and another is your uh, root involvement partial root involvement. Uh, dr dilip welcome to this thank platform. you thank right you. so thank you uh, dr lalit kumar Yes, sir. for discussing the spinal fragility fractures now we switch over to uh, there is a video presentation by dr gururaj for 5 minutes only dr gururaj are you there you will do it uh, sir i am there uh, rishi is okay. playing my video sir okay please it is so, it is for 6 minutes sir mo moot point is vertebroplasty versus kyphoplasty gururaj sangoji mat from delhi spinal injury center gururaj i think we have met a long ago yes hello friends right. uh, right. good morning today we will discuss about vertebroplasty versus kyphoplasty what is the main indication for uh, surgical treatment in osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures that is main indication is pain relief and fix the unstable fracture prevent complications like neurological deficits and improve the quality what are the surgical treatment options we have that is minimally invasive options like vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty and open procedures like pedicle screw fixation and osteotomy what are the real indications for vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty we all know that it is only rated in small subset of patients when you still see a high signal intensity on stir images which indicates a non union or a basically unhealed fracture when there is a pain on percussion on the particular vertebra increased activity on the bone scan and timing is really really crucial when we do kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty the main indication is pain that is pain and pain because this procedure is mainly indicated to relieve you of pain the contraindications are infection uncorrectable coagulopathies uh, neurological deficits and with possible colon compromise is related to complication especially for vertebroplasty when it comes to timing of the vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty there is a big ethical dilemma because the best results are achieved when we do it within 6 but we all know that most of these patients do improve and heal within 6 so there is a big ethical or a philosophical dilemma when to treat. so how we can guess which fractures to treat with vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty This Subita et al. classification it says that three is three types: spelled front type and bow-shaped type and projecting type 
are known for non union or collapsing so these fractures do need actually a vertebral plastic or mycoplasty earlier and if you have only air which is again a greater predictor for uh, uh collapsing of the collapse of the vertebral body so which the, these vertebra need uh, vertebral plastic or kyphoplasty how does it work it works by giving structural support and it also works by thermal properties when heat is generated it burns the nerve endings causing pain relief and it also can cause decompression indirect decompression by achieving the height and some people say it is a placebo so what are the options we have those are vertebroplasty and a balloon kyphoplasty first vertebroplasty was done in 1984 1986 uh, for aggressive vertebral hemangioma of c2 first vertebroplasty for osteoporotic fracture was done in 1989 and it had a big shortcoming of cement cleavage uh, that is why to improvise on vertebroplasty kyphoplasty was introduced and the first prototype was done in 1991 and patent was obtained in 1992 and first publication came out in 1998 what is the actual difference between vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty in vertebroplasty you just inject cement to the uh, fracture vertebra under high pressure and in kyphoplasty you first introduce balloon and then inflate it creating a low pressure environment and achieving some height correction and then uh, inject cement into this void created by the balloon so this is the difference in whatever plasty you just inject the, the cement but in kyphoplasty you actually inflate the balloon which corrects the actually uh, the height and causing uh, basically correction of the uh, kyphosis also and it stabilizes the vertebral body Uh, so uh, this is what is required for doing just vertebroplasty but you need this balloon and balloon inflator for doing kyphoplasty so this is how you can see that we can achieve height correction with the uh, kyphoplasty uh, with balloon kyphoplasty so you can see that this is one of the examples from 20 mm to we could achieve 24 mm height uh, with balloon kyphoplasty uh, so this is the first publication which uh, uh, came up and this 304 patients 603 procedures uh, so it showed that balloon kyphoplasty had just 8.6 percentage of cement leakage and vertebroplasty had 40% of cement leakage why is that because in vertebroplasty you inject a low viscosity cement under high pressure which is prone for more leakage but in kyphoplasty you inject a high viscosity cement under low pressure because you create a void inside the vertebral body and inject in this low pressure environment which actually decreases the cement leakage chances so multiple uh, studies they have showed that initially the vertebroplasty actually gives you a um, greater pain relief as compared to a uh, conservative treatment but then this free trial which came up for the kyphoplasty study it showed that there is no significant difference at 12 months but then kyphoplasty gave a good quality of life uh, in initial uh, period vetros 2 study again it showed that vertebroplasty gave a good pain relief but then controversy came with this 2009 uh, nejm study which said that vertebroplasty was stimulated for simulated procedures at one month there was no significant difference even those they showed that with vertebroplasty 64% had a pain relief and conservative had or a sham procedures had only 48% uh, pain relief so this again multiple studies said that basically vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty is just a sham procedure or a, it's a, a placebo so what is the main difference between vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty vertebroplasty is cheaper and quicker kyphoplasty is expensive because balloon costs more it takes no longer time restoration of the vertebral height is controversial because some people say restoration can be achieved only by positioning not by inflating the balloon and it has got less um, adjacent level fractures and less cement leakage and improved quality of life so uh, and what take home message is vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty both help you in achieving pain relief in these patients but kyphoplasty is more safer in terms of cement leakage thank you thank you thank you uh, professor gururaj uh, now the moot question remains in spite of discussing the pros and cons of both these techniques is kyphoplasty out of the race or not we will go into discussion so uh, let me introduce our panelist uh, dr raju 
Vaisya from Apollo Hospital, Delhi. Are you there still? Dr. Raju Vaisya? Perhaps he has left for attending the meeting. Dr. Swarnendu is definitely there. Swarnendu? Yes. 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 Swarnendu Samanta is there from Calcutta. Professor Abhay Ilhens and Professor Alok Agrawal, both from AIMS, respectively from Jodhpur and uh, Raipur. So, uh, I will like uh, Professor Abhay Ilhens to lead the discussion and uh, Dr. Dilip Majumdar will be coordinating. So, okay, thank you. Ab Ab Abhay, please. So the first thing, sir, uh, uh, would you like me to give uh, my opinion on it or would you like uh, uh, me to uh, lead uh, with a question? Uh, I think uh, question answers ultimately go to your opinions. So because of the constraint of time, uh, we would like to have your opinion on, on all the topics that have been discussed. And then, then maybe we can have a few questions in there. Okay, so sir, uh, basically what stands out uh, and has been highlighted by uh, all the authors and all the speakers is that uh, uh, osteoporosis essentially needs to be looked at differently because this is, uh, a, uh, this is a, uh, an, a situation or a pathology where the patient or the, uh, or the subject is an elderly. And uh, the basic premise is that we need to get the elderly back to functional status very, very soon. So the most important thing is to address and identify the problems, which start with basically a decreased bone mass. And then the second most important thing is that a lot of these fragility fractures and the injuries, they present with certain very specific issues. And those issues are that uh, there is a lot of combination in these fractures. The periarticular ones have articular impaction, which is a very important uh, component of how we need to deal with these injuries. They have uh, uh, an extensive uh, amount of uh, uh, combination, which basically defines how we need to look at them. And then the most important message that comes out of these uh, injuries is that uh, fixation alone sometimes is not important. You need to, one, do augmented okay. fixation. Secondly, one needs to do fixation with augmentation devices, not only in the implants, but also with techniques such as bone cement, with the uh, hydroxyapatite coated implants, with the uh, different kinds of void fillers and spacers. And the third most important thing is the concept, evolving concept of fix and replace. So, and the fourth thing is just replace. So, Replacement is a very real situation and a possibility in these patients. Fixation and replacement, minimal fixation and replacement is uh, another very important concept because it identifies restoration of structural integrity and continuity along with a possibility of a cyclical loading in the form of a replacement. So these are predominantly the influences. And the most important thing is that the pathology does not end here. So we are treating the acute problem with these treatment options. But at the end of the day, one needs to give supplemental medical treatment. And that essentially is restorative and will allow a better prognosis in terms of function and longevity of an elderly patient. Right. Thank you. And, uh, Dr. Yeah. Sornendu, we would like to have your like opinion it. on the subjects discussed. Uh, Professor Kotwal, you will be having the last word in the end regarding various implants. <coughs> I one simple question to my dear friend Ravi. Right. That suppose 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 you are fixing one osteoporotic fracture with a support eight hole plate. Uh, do, you, do you advocate that the the locking screw should be at the end? Suppose at number eight, number one, and number uh, eight screw, or you just leave with the cortical screw. Another one to just link to that one. Whether the classic length, which is having the normal screws at the top. Okay. Is Dr. Ravi there still? Dr. Ravi Sauta? Ravi, your, your, your thing is muted. 
Oh. Yes, sir, I am there. Okay, okay. So listen right. to so the Dr. question. Samantha, the, the, the cortical screw at the end of the plate helps push the plate closer to the bone. And other screws are locking screws which are used in a panning fashion. You can leave one, one, one screw, but full length of the cortices, at least four to five screws on the other end. And panning the plate long enough to do a relative plastic or a relative stability at the fracture site. My concern is that when you put the locking screws at the end, number one and number eight, these screws are as because the core is very thick. These are very notorious for these for this osteoporotic. There is a fracture, or they, even with the trivial trauma, they get a spiral ones. Sometimes, uh, if there is first of all, you are spanning nearly the whole board, so so that is something which is preferred uh, instead of just putting a smaller plate and. Secondly, the end screw or a terminal screw, which you put a last screw, that is generally not bicortical. That is a single cortex screw. Dr. Sauda. Yes, sir. Dr. Sauda. Yes. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, sir. Yeah, I heard your uh, lecture very nice and uh, very informative. One thing that has come to my mind, this whole bone while spanning will go into osteopenia again. Bone is osteopenic, bone is osteoporotic, bone is weak. Bone is susceptible to tragedy fracture, always there is tragedy fracture. And there is osteopenia. So how do you counteract all these things by your principle? You are treating and your second brain. and second question is what is the recent advance? In uh, spending, the advantage of spending is that stress risers are lessened, and also you are treating your patient for osteoporosis. So in general, you are improving the quality of bone for these patients who are being fixed for the fractures. Uh, and where the bone has been spanned. Uh, in recent ad advances, uh, uh, trauma sim, which is used through the fenestrated screws for fixation, uh, either in the uh, metaphyseal junctions or a metadiaphyseal junction, that is one component which has come up. Second is that we have started these days using more and more augmented fixation. Like, for example, there is a distal femoral fracture where there is a metaphyseal combination. Now, we are not just doing a doing a lock plate for the distal femur. We are also adding an intermediary nail or a fibular strut to augment fixation, especially when there is a metadiaphyseal junctional fracture. These are very, very uh, highly stressful junctions where, uh, first of all, the cortices are very thin and they, the, the angular, despite using a angular stable devices like uh, lock plates, there is a still breakage of these plates which occur. So, in order to augment the fixation, uh, additional fixation in the form of uh, either intramedullary implant or better to use the uh, allograft or autograft for the fibula, uh, fibula stick uh, or a strut uh, to improve the fixation in these areas. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Very nice. uh, and now, one thing that I talked about in uh, that uh, the unsolved, so called unsolved fracture neck of the femur have an answer been there and it is said that a triangular fixation device should hopefully un should hopefully unite the fracture neck of the femur so any comment from the panelist or yes, from sir. the speaker I, I think the i think the new device probably in the market is now the fracture, fracture neck system yes which which is which has got the which has got the triangular system and probably once it, it was launched in the India probably we start immediately we started doing it, doing it and I think it's a very very stable construct because this construct is triangular and it becomes a one piece and it allows um, your collapse up to like seven no it is allowable limit is twenty but we never expect it to be twenty like five seven millimeter is allowable in this fracture neck system so I think this new fracture neck system is a beautiful implant for the osteoporotic neck femur fractures. Yes, you have rightly emphasized. 
डॉक्टर अभय योर एक्सपीरियंसेस सर द फेमोरल नेक सिस्टम इज नॉट अ पनाशिया फॉर अ नेक फीमर एंड इट इज नॉट अ सॉल्यूशन it basically takes away the problems that were associated with the standard uh, screw side plate device in terms of the fact that it allows a slightly multi directional fixation uh, in the neck and in the subchondral bone of the head but when it comes to the post remedial termination which can happen in these situations very frequently and more especially with the elderly osteoporotic fragility factors it again is uh, has the same a propensity for failure as the yes. standard and existing fixation devices and that is where uh, the recent concept of because the most important thing in all these fragility fractures is to get the elderly person back to full weight bearing function very fast and the solution in those situations increasingly is now moving and shifting towards a cyclical loading devices and those are arthroplasty solutions uh, alok agarwal are you there Professor Alok, I think he has left. Uh, now I would like to know from Professor Kothwal his comments first on these triangular devices. Professor Kothwal, yeah, uh, I actually I agree with Abhay about this. Although I don't have any personal experience about the triangular device uh, and about the um, other implants that you are talking about, Good. and uh, of course the osteoporosis. Actually, we have learnt it very hard way. you know starting from the locking plates which gave the angular fixation to augmented uh, screws which actually you can put in uh, cement through them as well then we learned to do use the uh, intramedullary devices load sharing devices rather than uh, the plates And now of course as uh, abhay again said you know the this thing is for uh, Uh, the replacement is becoming more and more common in most of the uh, periarticular fractures, whether it is involving the shoulder or the elbow, or the hip, and sometimes at the knee as well. Right. Uh, Alok Agrawal is not there, but then he had written that incorporation as augmentation of biphosphonates <laughs> is important. Uh, later development and so bisphosphonates can be incorporated in fixation <laughs> devices any comment alok uh, abhay so can you please come again with the statement y yes uh, oh, oh. what was emphasized there are publications that do not give bone cement give bisphosphonate group of drugs along with the implant maybe screw so, the, so there is there, there yes. is there is basically a, a fundamental difference between <clears throat> bone cement and the additional augmentation mechanical augmentation devices and the biological augmentation devices right. and that basic differentiation is that the mechanical augmentation devices like calcium phosphate cement or the bone cement pmma itself is that it gives a very acute and instant mechanical Uh, augmentation and the the uh, so these are very specific situations and sometimes they that the usage and the requirement is far more important and better to augment fixations if one is using osteosynthesis the biological augmentation devices is part of the medical treatment program and basically a, a step to augment this the overall long term strength and health of the bone stock and that has to be given whether or not somebody is using a mechanical augmentation device with the osteosynthetic procedure so the two are not irreversible uh, or or interchangeable with each other the biological augmentation is a must do is part of the long term bone regenerative process and the mechanical strength is the acute strengthening uh, augmentation procedure whether as a stand alone or with a fixation device depending upon the region that is involved right thank you uh, professor kothwal uh, you you have been a trustee so the old concept of rigid fixation definitely has gone for a change could you elaborate a bit uh, now actually what you need is a, a stable fixation other than rigid fixation and that is why even with the concept of uh, 
uh, pleating a, a bone, a long bone, it is now again the emphasis is that it should not be a very rigid fixation. That's why the uh, the working length of a plate and then uh, you have to have a longer plate and with uh, you should leave some uh, holes uh, without the screw so that you don't make it a rigid fixation because that rigid fixation uh, may lead to failure, implant failure or failure to unite. And um, that is why the uh, emphasis is again, like I said in the beginning, it's more of a, a stable fixation, preserving the biology of the bone. Right. Uh, can Abhara. I make, can I make yes, a point please, which please, we please. have not discussed till yeah. far and it is right. very, very important and especially with fragility fractures. And the, that point is that when we think of osteoporotic fractures and fragility fractures, and when these periarticular fractures uh, involve the ball and socket joints or the multi-axial joints like the shoulder and the hip, as science stands today, the arthroplasty options are excellent salvage options allowing a patient to get back to instant full function very, very soon. When it comes to the limited mobility joints, such as the uh, distal radial articulations or the ankle articulations, arthroplasty options are not the best solutions. And arthrodesis as salvage option is a brilliant solution because they allow excellent function and they allow a person to continue doing their function very well. So arthrodesis is a very established form of uh, a very established a good solution to these, especially these problems. Now, the, the concept of the internuncial or the or the intercalary joints like the elbow and the knee, the science as it stands today, the elbow, uh, uh, the, the functionality and the longevity of uh, technological developments in the, in the knee are probably a little more than what we see in the elbow. The Kothwal sir will have a better uh, uh, a comment on that. But uh, the knee arthrodesis is still a salvage to a failed fixation, but an arthroplasty solution is still very viable. Whereas it comes to elbow uh, arthroplasty, the longevity of an elbow arthroplasty, if a patient is 70, 75, vis-a-vis -vis somebody who is 80, 85, uh, uh, has limited longevity as compared to the arthrodesis. So here again, basically looking at the time of presentation, the age, the disease, the activity level has to be considered in choosing the most appropriate solution for uh, the elderly with the fragility factor. Yes, I'm, I I'm come for, to, yes, please, yes, please, I please. Agree with Dr. Ravai, but the main problem is that probably still the unsolved one is still around the shoulder because many shoulder uh, fragility fractures we see, but the important criteria whether to go ahead with the fixation because you know whatever fixation you probably do in very very osteoporotic shoulders this is going to fail the, the, then the question what sort of arthroplasty probably are going to do the sir, the, the, sir the the question and the problem with the shoulder as compared to the hip basically lies with the morphology of the shoulder as compared to the hip so the hip is a more is a is a far superior uh, multi-axial joint than the shoulder, which is inherently unstable. And science as it stands today has not been able to give us a perfect solution, a metallurgical solution, as, as good a solution as it has given to us for the hip. Yes, but yes, that, that but arthrodesis as an option for the shoulder still is a poor solution as compared to an arthroplasty in unsalvageable or extensively communicated situation. Yes, that, that's I'm coming, Dr. Ravai, that the, the, I think the, the arthroplasty solution is tall, is not that accurate like the hips one. So whenever you take the decision around the what so like your hemi or the total shoulder or the reverse ones, we, it has to be very judicious decision because the, we the don't... The problem know. is in our understanding of what the perfect anatomy is and how to restore it. The problem is not in offering principally the difference. So, Principally, arthrodesis is a poor solution for the shoulder and the hip. Uh, yeah. But functionally, the shoulder arthroplasty science and technology is not as well understood and developed as the hip arthroplasty and technology solutions are as of yeah, today. That's, that's why. That's why shoulder is still a the, the gray bone 
what, where to where to go and with and which plus arthroplasty has to be selected. I think the age is the most important criteria for that. And that right. is where probably when it comes to shoulder augmentation procedures with osteosynthetic options is still a very viable option yes. because it still allows a, a reasonable <laughs> amount of good function. Right. Coming back to elbow, Professor Kotwal. Professor Kotwal, are you there? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes, Professor Kotwal. Yeah. So, in uh, my experience, what I have found that the various patients undergoing arthroplasty for one or the other reason, uh, they are comparatively younger. So, Dr. Abhay was talking about longevity of the arthroplasty. And for the same reason, I personally feel that patients who cannot afford, they should be offered a choice of even excision arthroplasty, and that also gives a good result. Your comments, please. Yes. Uh, excisional arthroplasty has been there in practice, actually, particularly in the earlier times. As a senior resident or as a this thing, I have seen times when my boss, Professor Chandra, used to do elbow ortho, excisional orthoplasty, and uh, he taught me as well. So that actually used to work very well for that matter. But then there used to be problems associated with uh, excisional orthoplasty and that of an instability at the elbow. Manual. That was the, the one thing, number one. Number two, about the orthoplasty of the elbow. Generally, the orthoplasty works well particularly for rheumatoid arthritis, for which it was actually uh, initially started with. And the results of in, with in, uh, rheumatoid arthritis are better because the, the, uh, uh, in rheumatoid patients, the muscles and these things are not normal. So the load on the joint is less and then they get immediate relief with, from pain and uh, as the disease is removed and and that it lasts a little longer as compared to younger patients or the elderly patients where we do it for trauma. Number three, the elbow arthroplasty is actually gives movement, but it, it is actually does not give you strength for that matter. So the patient has is advised not to lift weight of more than one kg with that limb. And that uh, sometimes is actually not followed by the patient, which leads to failure of the arthroplasty uh, within a few years or so. About the arthrodesis, arthrodesis can be a good option, other this thing, but, and of course, a stable and painless joint and gives stability. But generally, it is uh, not so easy to obtain arthrodesis because of the bone stock. The bone stock is not much, and particularly in cases where there have been destruction because of the fracture or because of the disease, the, the quality of the bone and the bone stock is less. So sometimes the orthodesis does not uh, work too well. It, you cannot achieve orthodesis. And in that situation, if the patient cannot afford an orthoplasty, I mean the replacement orthoplasty, then it is better to do an excisional orthoplasty. I would prefer to do an excisional orthoplasty rather than an orthodesis of the, of the elbow. Right. Thank you. Now, one more question regarding uh, there are surgeons who are who claim to be more an intramedullary fixation device user surgeon and others are for extramedullary. So if we have to discriminate between the two, what is the latest uh, input? Yeah. Professor Kotwal, between the two. Uh, yes, exactly. I think. Uh, exactly, Professor Kotwal. Yes. This was my question. <laughs> this was my question. <laughs> That is a distal radius fracture. Professor Kotwal. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad to meet you after a long time. Yes, sir. So, actually, uh, this was my question that Professor Jha asked. Yes. I was going to ask you about the distal radius fracture, whether you uh, use a distal, <laughs> long intramedullary nail along with the fixation or not. But distal radius, actually, there uh, have been development of a device where there is an, an intramedullary nail which you insert from the uh, distal fragment and then you augment it with an interlock kind of a screw. But that generally a good uh, implant is, as far as to my best of my knowledge, is not available here. 
<laughs> otherwise, if you look at the literature, there are those intramedullary devices. So I personally have no experience with intramedullary device. And however, I also came across uh, one or two articles uh, in the French or this thing literature where they have used a, a small replacement joint for the wrist. I mean, a, a modified one, which actually for like we do it for the elbow, they would replace or for the shoulder for the matter, they would do a hemi orthoplasty for the wrist joint. But again, you know, those are the things of a very uh, few one or two articles and they have claimed good results. But again, the like you asked the question, the intramedullary nail uh, is generally, as to my knowledge, is not available. Yet. So I have no experience with the intramedullary nail. Can I can I take this question, sir? Yes. Please. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, as sir said very rightly, Dr. Professor Kotwal sir, upper limb intramedullary fixations are not a very go-to solution all the time, even though there may be some functional anticipated benefits of intramedullary fixations. But when it comes to the lower limb, the intramedullary fixation essentially gets a very perceptible benefit of uh, load sharing as compared to load bearing. And those uh, that you know, fundamentally difference in concept allows uh, intramedullary devices to be uh, preferable solutions when it comes to lower limb uh, fracture situations where an uh, intramedullary device can be put. So that is principally how they differ uh, between the uh, lower limb and the upper limb. And between platers and nailers, I think what works best in somebody's hands is what should be done. But if, uh, if one is uh, in the uh, uh, process and one is basically treating fragility fractures, then one has to train themselves well in the art of both. Because somewhere, especially lower limb, the elderly or the uh, not so elderly with an osteoporotic bone will need a load sharing device as a better device to allow a faster return to function. I think Professor Jha was asking that the, the whether to go ahead with the long ones, the intermediate ones. I think for the lower limbs, even for the uh, trochanter fractures in the osteoporotic lady, we never do this not PFL. We always span the whole femur for the fear that probably some, some stress is going to come around the isthmus. So a very old people, osteoporotic lady, I think we all do the PFLs. And also same is true for the uh, for the PFLs also in osteoporotic. Can I, can I, can I contribute a little bit? Yes. Yes, yes. So, uh, so when uh, it comes to literature, there is no difference whether you use a short device or a long device for the intertrochanteric trochanteric fractures. Uh, problem is that uh, most of the implants which earlier were available other than the recently uh, improved uh, uh, TFNA, the, the diameter of the nail or a curvature of the nail does not fit with the flow of the limb and there is a very high chance of a stress riser at the lower end of the long nail. Second is that uh, most of these patients are elderly having our knee joints which are bad. So, if you use a very long implant, uh, replacement is an issue because that may be required sooner or later in these patients. So, first surgery you have to do for a removal of the implant or a putting in a short needle and then do the replace, uh, surgery for, uh, for uh, the, the knee replacement. So, uh, this is what uh, probably my thought is. Uh, as uh, Dr. Shonindu, uh, Dr. Sabi is saying, uh, uh, for a preference for the longer nail. So I don't prefer to use a long nail uh, in these patients if it is uh, not required. Sir, another thought process with the long and short nails is that as Dr. Sota Ravi has uh, very correctly enunciated, there is no difference in the literature between the long and short devices principally. But what happens in an elderly situation is, that a short PFN in an osteopenic bone is first thing is that we are uh, introducing a straight fixation device in a curved hollow cylinder, which itself creates a stress riser. That's one, especially osteoporotic situation. Second thing is that the introduction of a screw at the level of the curvature, the anterolateral bow of the femur creates a point of relative stiffness in the fixation. And this leads to bending moments and therefore you see short oblique fractures and transverse fractures at the tip of the nail 
in the elderly osteoporotic fractures where when they fail so those are two situations which have actually uh, are, uh, pushed the community towards using longer nails for fixation as compared to shorter nails of course as dr ravi said with the elderly with degenerative arthritis of the knee there are additional problems with even the long devices so short versus long those are the things, things that one needs to keep in mind right we can keep on discussing endlessly so dr dilip now it is your turn to conclude and uh, yeah, before and, uh, before i hand it over to you uh, i have one uh, uh, i here with would like dr abhay alhens to form guidelines as far as implants are concerned and uh, dr kothwal will also coordinate uh, uh, coordinate no dr kothwal will also separately form his guidelines so we yeah. will have two guidelines only for the implants okay both choice choice of implants both so. intramedullary and extramedullary so that uh, we can come to a final conclusion the deadline will be two weeks right will that be acceptable okay we will we'll yes sure sure i'll coordinate with abhay and we'll work yeah. it because we have discussed so many things but exactly implant wise we have not gone into details so uh, we will like to have those details in our guidelines that we are going to form okay now so thank you thank you professor ja actually i came a little late but what i observed that everybody has covered up almost all the aspects of these things but clear wisdom uh, i think is uh, clear wisdom is not there in my opinion it will come that, when we we, yeah. are, we are writing it finally on yeah, the yeah, yeah yeah clear wisdom is not there no not earlier also not now also i am not happy with that because i want that to teach almost like a word 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 but here actually 2 plus 2 becomes 3 or 2 plus 2 becomes 5 so that is the problem here lies number 1 number 2 about the nail and the plate that you told it is an age old problem long ago you see grammar plate has gone into the museum if you remember the surface implant long ago 30 40 years ago pp uh, patwal sir knows this and uh, when he came as an examiner here in calcutta also long ago i remember that this surface implants that was their uh, evolution went on and on, on and on till today it is going on eo has failed and a new concept has come like that so in this way everybody has covered up nicely actually i was with the this injection technique for this spine you know failed failed back syndrome cases where fixation was there then again uh, this eo uh, uh, or your Professor John's arthropathy has started. Then how to do this injection? This technique I was there, so I came late today. Sorry for that. So actually, um, I want to know about the spine because the Lalit Kumar, I think he actually told about the spine. Lalit, Lalit yes. Kumar. Yes, you are right. Yeah, as I remember. Yeah. So is there? What is the recent de uh, development or recent advances in that? I heard that there is some uh, something called that. one way valve one way valve plastic valve has been introduced into the vertebral body so that the the spillage that greatest problem with the spillage of the cement that is can be uh, reduced so i i uh, nobody has actually highlighted uh, that i want to know and another thing that patwal uh, sir pp patwal sir has told that uh, this uh, you will make the formulations of the use of various implants and their modification and all that he will he will tell that but the augmentation by cement in distal radius fracture is again a really a problem so we do cement uh, uh, technique in uh, in the fixation of the distal radius fracture also regarding elbow it is okay because uh, elbow we we are doing this excision arthroplasty in earlier days but when boxis prosthesis came we Used to do the boxes first. They are mostly remodeled cases. Very nice. So those are actually accepted things. But new things that will come up, new enlightenment or new wisdom will come after we compile everything together. 
and synthesize and then we will supply protein our association Fi final few words from professor subir subir is not uh, there he is there he is there he is there professor subir professor subir are you there professor subir mukherjee you have to unmute sir you have to unmute sir subir sir you have to unmute unmute yourself professor subir sir you just sir you have to unmute it unmute sir you just hold the space bar you just hold the space bar then you go on speaking am i clear now yes yeah yes. yeah 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 thank you very much no i am really really sorry for all the disturbance caused today so you have to as a, as a matter of fact when you talk of implants every implant depends upon the fracture pattern and you have to take a decision accordingly and fortunately these designs are coming more and more and we have better plethora of implants to choose the ultimate aim is to properly stabilize the fracture at that site so th these things are important so so many interesting discussions have taken place regarding orthoplasty whether replacement or or external orthoplasty see dr abhay has very rightly said that whenever feasible whenever feasible we are replacing the hip joint in proximal several fractures and also shoulder joint i mean sir dr samanta would know better in proximal humerus fracture and dr kotwal you should also see the feasibility of uh, risk orthoplasty in those cases where any other form of uh, i mean stabilization is not feasible and the length of space comfortable to as disturbing Discussion is concerned. Right. So, with these words, yeah, with these words, finally conclude and request Dr. K. D. Tiwari to have his vote of thanks. K. D. Tiwari is there ready? Yes, sir. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's uh, all credit to the our leader that Ramesh Sen and Navi Thakkar. They are making it possible. to happen especially on the sunday morning and thanks to the doctor our our bhishma pitama doctor is cha sir he is always there to coordinate the things and uh, to come for the rescue and to make the things available and to help you to intervene everything he is always there Maybe. and yeah. dilip bhai hello how are you yeah. how yeah, are fine, you fine thank you lovely to see you again bana gudan hello how are you and my sincere thanks to dr abhay elias for the from the jodhpur dr kotwal from the am ravi sahta and sorendu we had the wonderful session especially i would like to thank dr lalit kumar for giving us a tremendous response about tip about the surgical intervention in the osteoporosis and gurunath for comparing the vertebroplasty and the kyphoplasty make it so simple and easy so any common general surgeon can also understand thanks to dr kotwal once again making us to believe that it still the elbow arthroplasty and excisor arthroplasty of the elbow still works that we have seen it in the elbow and in the hip thanks everybody thanks to the ortho tv thanks to the raju guys and thanks to sarendu thanks to lakar sir for wonderful Sunday morning, making it happen right away. Right right right. right. Yesterday, no, 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 I one more. No, no, Chinmay is there. Chinmay, Chinmay. One more. Chinmay is there. Line. Yesterday we hit number of goals in the night. Now we are mm -hmm. hitting goals here, here. Right. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank Stay you. Uh, Doctor, continue. Doctor Kothwal, Doctor <laughs> Swarnendu, Doctor Chinmay. our president of iora president of iua and dr dilip thank you all thank you, thank thank you very you, much from my side thank you sir so we will shortly be hearing from professor kotwal and professor abhay jain sure yeah right sure thank you.
Next time you'll all meet again. Okay, then. Thank you. Okay. Good day, sir. Good day. Good day. Thank Guru Guru Raj. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. Sir. Bye. Guru Raj is in the you. spinal injury center. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you you were there for how many years? Sir, now thirteen years, sir. Yeah, yeah. I I went to your center for. Taking yes, yes, I remember. I, I remember, sir. I remember. <laughs> In the garden party. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, bye, bye. Okay, bye, sir. Bye, 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 bye. bye. bye.